You didn't give me control. <laughs> oh, that's me. I've been around for a while. This is, uh, I'm going into my 11th year um, as the director of Metro Cert. Um, so, love to, best job ever, just saying. Um, so, I'm going to review, there's a total of 13 best practices related in some way, shape, or form to electric vehicles, but we're going to focus on a couple key ones. I'm just going to put them up here, and, and um, I'm not really going to talk deeply about them, but um, under best practice 13, the action number two is to right size or downsize your city fleet with the most fuel efficient vehicles that are optimal size and capacity for their intended function. Um, and then also under 13 um, is best practice action three, which is to phase in no idling practices, operational and fuel changes, and equipment changes, including electric vehicles for cities or local transit fleets. So that's the fleet piece. There's a big effort around that um, that we're hoping to get more folks involved in. Uh, best practice 18, um, the action number seven, document the operation and maintenance or construction remodeling of at least one park building using an asset management tool, the um, Sustainable Building 2030 Energy Standard or Green Building Framework to include some electric vehicle components. Uh, number, best practice number 23, action five, to install, assist with, and promote one or more public fueling stations for plug-in hybrid and, and full electric vehicles, fuel flex, ethanol vehicles, and CNG, that's um, uh, uh, natural, natural gas vehicles. Best practice, practice action six under the same um, one is promote green businesses that are recognized under a local, regional, or national program. And that is it for the main best practices, but Brian Ross um, is going to come up here in a little bit and really kind of go over what we're calling EV readiness. I mean, we've, some of us, some of you may have heard that we've done a lot of work on solar ready cities, and we're trying to do the same kind of concept with electric vehicles and electrification of your transit system. And so Brian's going to really illuminate what does that mean to be an EV or electric vehicle ready community and um, touch on some of the other best practices as well. So with that, I will introduce my friend and colleague, Brian Ross. There's so many best practices, I had to make sure I wrote some of them down here. So, <laughs> notes. Um, so thanks for coming here. Um, and am I off here yet? Yes. The next slide. There you okay. go. Oh, there I am. Okay. Um, I hate that picture. I'm going to have to get a change. Uh, anyway, I do a lot of work around uh, solar energy, and many of you I know, representing the faces in the audience that have heard me present on solar energy. Um, but uh, we're also working kind of a, a similar initiative. We're trying to get started at uh, Great Plains Institute in Green Staff Cities, which is uh, we have talked a lot previously. I have around solar ready communities. We're going to talk about EV ready communities. It's kind of taking the same set of principles and really talking about how does communities help do market transformation work um, as this EV phenomenon kind of rolls out and becomes kind of big across the nation. Uh, how do you get ready for that? How do you make sure that you're maximizing the benefit of that locally? And how do you make sure that you're uh, avoiding some of the barriers and problems that might come up um, that in, 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 as this new technology rolls out and as the market changes? So um, I'm going to uh, start with my, uh, my conclusions, as I usually do. Um, so this is uh, really kind of the one thing you have to remember that I'm trying to leave you with in, in this presentation is that, that local governments really are an essential partner in creating this self-sustaining electric vehicle market. Um, this is not something that, that happens to you. It's something that you really need to participate in and, tr and work at in order to kind of bring this about and make it, make it really happen. EV market transformation really requires that public and private development accommodates EV charging infrastructure. This is a, a key component to market transformation efforts around electric vehicles. Local governments can and do now shape how public and private development occurs. Local government is where development occurs, both in the private sector um, and in the public sector, of course, at the, at the local government level. And this is something that you're already doing. It's something that you need to think about how these EV infrastructure development fits into that um, and, uh, and, and something to keep in mind when you're when your city councils or, or, or it's kind of some people say, why are we getting involved in this? It's because you're already involved in it. This is not something we're asking you to do that, you're, that, that, is, um, that is new to the local governments. So we're just asking you to say, look at what you're already doing and make sure you're accommodating EV de uh, development in the way that makes most sense. Local governments already have existing tools 
to foster the community's transition to EVs. So we're not talking about doing new things, we're talking about doing the same things differently. Uh, Diana went over some of the best practices that, that um, uh, are directly applicable in Green Step Cities to, to EVs. A, there are a number of other ones that I'm going to touch on, but the main one that I wanted to talk about is the kind of big policy issue, because this is, to me, as a, I'm, a, I'm a planner by trade, uh, and uh, so I like to talk about plans, uh, I like to talk about um, uh, policy. So the, the, uh, in this particular best practice, which is 6.5, comprehensive planning, um, it doesn't specifically mention EVs, but it is the kind of core and foundation for all the things that local governments need to think about in EVs. If, if you're a Green Step Cities, you're trying to affect energy use in your community, or in some cases, people want to actually say, we want to have a climate actions in our cities. Um, whichever way you want to do it, the, the Green Step City best practice here is incorporating energy and climate issues into your, into your policy. Um, and if you think of policy typically as comprehensive plans, and I know that that's very relevant to um, a lot of the metro area communities right now because everybody's in the midst of redoing their comprehensive plan. So this is an opportunity to make sure that in your comprehensive plan you're addressing energy and climate issues. And part of that, as I'm going to talk about in a, in a couple minutes, is an important part of it and critical part is um, transportation and electric vehicles as a strategy. So this is kind of the best practice to really focus on the foundation that all the other ones ultimately should be resting on. Um, we have uh, an initiative that we'll, we've been working on and many of the people in this room are participating in uh, at the, oops, I click one too. Oh, okay, I'm hitting too, too many buttons. Um, Regional Indicators Initiative, um, which is a, a, um, a benchmarking um, d uh, data, uh, uh, data set. Well, this show of hands, who here is part of the Regional Indicators Initiative? Yeah, see, we have a number of people in the room. C cities have, have data on energy in the Regional Indicators Initiative. You can kind of see this demonstration about how it works on the website. Um, this is uh, particularly uh, important. Uh, we, we look at a lot of the, the data on this uh, as from the standpoint of buildings, but we also have a whole component around transportation. And this is kind of the, the help to get understand what your existing conditions are in your community around energy. So to kind of go back to that best practice around policy, it is important for in your policy, in your plans, to incorporate um, energy and out of the regional indicators initiative, we kind of have been developing these existing conditions baselines for um, where your greenhouse gas emissions are coming from, which of course is whether you're using that as your, as your measurement for energy or not, it is a good uh, kind of common currency to use to understand energy use. And the important thing about this graphic, I have three different communities up here. I have city of Woodbury, city of Hopkins, and the county, Was of, uh, well, uh, county of Washington, Washington County. Um, and you can see that uh, the important thing here is that in all of these, transportation emissions are a very large piece of the total pie. If you want to set energy goals, if you want to address energy reduction or greenhouse gas reduction in your community, you can't meaningfully move, move ahead without addressing the transportation piece. In, a, in Washington County, for instance, we're looking at a, a very large area, a lot of bedroom communities in there. Uh, a lot of transportation, 46% of the total greenhouse gas emissions in that county as a community are coming from transportation. Uh, city of Hopkins, where you're looking at a, a smaller geographic area, a little bit more density, um, it's, it's as small as 25%. Um, but it, it is, even there, a significant piece of your, your energy in your community. And as a Green Step Cities, we really want to urge people to address not only the kind of building components, but also the transportation pieces. Um, we have, in, in terms, that's the existing conditions, and then we have an example here of the desired conditions, the uh, St. Louis Park uh, draft, as I have to check with Shannon here, um, uh, the draft greenhouse gas reduction goals that they have for their community where they've set a climate neutral goal by 2040. And if, this is the wedge analysis that, that is part of the regional indicators initiative um, website. You can go to it and kind of 
put, ha, put your own community in there and kind of play with us a little bit. This is part of an extensive process working with uh, St. Louis Park stakeholders to identify how they're going to get to climate neutrality by 2040. And the pieces I just wanted to point out here, I guess I have a laser pointer on this, don't I? Um, the, the, the kind of greenish uh, wedge here is the travel strategies piece. So this is, this is the baseline. Um, if everything stayed as it was in 2016, where how it would look going out to 2040, and then each one of these wedges is a little piece on how they can reduce greenhouse gases in their community. The green one is travel strategies, and then also down here, this gray one is what they call advanced travel strategies. So it's actually things that um, that will require um, a, a greater and longer term kind of investment in over time. But you can see between that gray bar and that green bar, that's a significant component of the overall strategy that they need to achieve. So this is important. We have existing, existing conditions. Uh, transportation is a major component of energy use in your community. Desired conditions, transportation is a major component of what you need to do. And so then you have to figure out what the strategies are moving forward. So transportation and greenhouse gas emissions, I have a few slides on this. Um, this is a national uh, uh, tracking of uh, greenhouse gas emissions um, over time. You can see from 1988 all the way out to 2016. Um, and the, the graph on the left is the one that's easiest to read. Uh, but the important thing here is that for most of the time that we've been talking about greenhouse gas reductions and managing energy use in our nation, we've been talking about the electric power sector. Because that's where the greenhouse gas emissions come, right? Coal-fired power, um, uh, natural gas power, uh, that's been the, the single largest piece of it. And you can see that in 2016, that changed, is that we've been cleaning up the, the electric power generation sector. And now transportation nationally is the largest emitter of greenhouse gases in the nation. So this is something that we have to we recognize nationally, but we need to recognize it locally because that's where we're going to make the difference and that's where we're going to really take action. So kind of another demonstration of that is if we, if we look at the breakdown of greenhouse gas emissions again nationally, um, uh, the, and you take out the electric power as a separate sector and then you look at the other sectors, industrial, residential, commercial, which is primarily in this case um, heating fuels. Uh, you can again see that transportation in 2016 is the bit single biggest component of that. Not that we should ignore these other pieces. Obviously, you need to kind of address what the energy use is um, in, in your residential, the heating energy use in your residential and electric uh, or commercial buildings, um, as well as electric, electric power is still a significant piece. But this is what the trend is, and this is where we need to go. We've kind of figured out the electric power sector in terms of where we need to go. We have a long ways to go yet, but we, need, we know how that's going to work. Transportation is the most difficult piece. Um, there's basically three ways that you can address greenhouse gas emissions or energy use in transportation. And, and these are all things that happen primarily at the local level or, or in, in conjunction with local governments. And that is to increase efficiency of your transportation modes, which is primarily better efficient vehicles. Um, mode shifting, which is getting people out of cars and into other things, bicycles, pedestrians, transit or fuel switching, changing from gasoline to something that's carbon-free or lower energy content. So, um, and that is where we're going to put, be focusing on today. And this is something that we have this, have put this up on the screen. It's also in one of the handouts that I think you guys have, you may, may have picked up. Um, this, is, this kind of gives a demonstration of, of the importance of electric vehicles um, as a strategy for achieving your greenhouse gas reduction goals or your energy reduction goals. Um, that uh, the, the kind of carbon emissions uh, from a gasoline vehicle in Minnesota, this was all compiled by our um, my colleagues at the uh, Great Plains Institute. Um, very, you can see the carbon emissions very high. You can go down and look at a, a green an electric vehicle in Minnesota with, where we're using primarily a tar sands gasoline. Um, is very high. Um, an electric vehicle in the general region here, MISO region, uh, which is a multi-state uh, region, is uh, significantly lower where the, we're taking into account in this case, the emissions from the power plant that are 
of then powering the electric vehicle. Uh, in Excel service territory, it's even lower because the, the electricity is cleaner. Excel has a cleaner mix than the, than the region does. Um, and then if you power your EV, of course, with, a, um, re with renewable energy, it's almost nothing. So this is kind of the, what we're trying to get to and what we're looking at in terms of kind of addressing local um, greenhouse gas emissions associated with transportation. Um, I also just wanted to kind of let, give you a little heads up, a very interesting data set that we um, might want to look at. The uh, National Renewable Energy Lab has this, has this fascinating uh, set of data called the city sleep or the local, uh, state and local energy data. Um, a component of that is for every single city in the nation, they have compiled all of the vehicle registrations. Um, and so they know exactly what kind of vehicles are registered in what, kind of, in what community. So this, for instance, is the city of um, White Bear Lake. Yeah, here we go. Uh, in the city of White Bear Lake, we're looking at the total number of light duty vehicles. It gives a number. It gives how much is gasoline, how much is other, and then what the components of that other are. And so you can see that in, in almost every one of these communities, it is a um, something like between 87 and 90 percent of the vehicles, light duty vehicles, are gasoline vehicles. Um, and the remaining piece that are other are primarily that the big uh, red sort of part of it is the flex fuel. So that's really ethanol. Um, and we, as we all know that many people who have ethanol vehicles are actually filling them up with gasoline. So um, we, we still have a very small component of our total fleets in each one of the cities is something that's not gasoline. Um, and so you can kind of see that it's about the same. This is the, uh, the city of Edina. Um, Roughly the same. I think this is actually 2016 data. I think a dino was important because it was the one city that I found that there actually was a little sliver of green here, which is electric. Um, so we do have, it's actually starting to show up on the pie chart, and that's a good thing, right? Um, and here is, uh, to get outside the metro, this is the city of Rochester. And again, there actually was, you can't, there's no, there is electric vehicles in the registration data that's not big enough to actually show up on the pie chart. So we have a long ways to go. And we have a data set that's being tracked, and hopefully they'll be updating this with, with more uh, recent data um, as time goes on. But uh, it's something that you can get to um, from the National Renewable Energy Lab for any city in the nation. Uh, so why are electric vehicles important? Um, this is kind of understanding that when local governments are doing planning for infrastructure, they need to th really think about what's going to happen in the future rather than what's happening today. So we look at those tiny fragments of electric vehicles uh, in terms of the kind of mix of, of, uh, of vehicles that you see in your city. Uh, you don't want to plan for your transportation infrastructure for uh, the, 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 the mix of vehicles you have today. You want to look out to what it's going to be in 20 or 30 or 40 years because that's the length of time in which you're planning for your infrastructure. When you build a road, you don't build it for the volume you see today, you build it for the volume you're going to see in 20 years, right? Because otherwise, you'll be, you have congestion immediately. That's kind of the way we think about infrastructure. When you build a new sewer line, you don't build it for what the homes that are built today. You build it for the homes that you know are going to have be built in 20 years. This is why it's important to understand this data, which is the growth, the forecast growth of electric vehicles in the nation. And you can actually, this is uh, in the world. And the blue line here is the United States. Um, and this is the short-term view. It goes from 2015 to 21. And at this point, we're looking, by 2021, we're looking at new car sales in, in the United States estimated to be over 4% electric vehicles. And this is a long-term forecast over here. And if you look at, um, in the United States, we're looking at, it for Bloomberg Energy, Bloomberg Energy Finance, it's forecasting around 50% um, by 2040 of the new vehicle sales will be electric vehicles. So that's the reality that you need to think about your infrastructure and the way you do development in your community. And probably one of the more important things, I find this fascinating anyway, is that the, the, this graph shows two different forecasts. The blue ones down at the bottom, that was the forecast um, that Bloomberg New Energy Finance used in 2015. And the red is what they came up with in 2016. So <laughs> it's a little bit different, right? I mean, 
the, the world is changing so fast that the people who are trying to forecast it can't keep up. So this is the reality in which you need to think about how development occurs in your community. And the reason for these kind of changes are really the declining cost in, in, of, of batteries. That we're seeing uh, the, the battery cost, which is the main component, of course, of energy storage in an electric vehicle, has been coming down so rapidly that by the time numbers get published, they're already out of date. So we know this is happening. We know it, it, it's going to continue. Every, everyone in the industry, everyone, even the people in the oil and gas industry, are all saying this is going to happen. So it is the reality. So in all that, what does this mean? Um, we had came up with what communities need to think about in terms of preparing for this new reality. We have five principles of what an EV ready community is. And the five principles are you have to address EV and EV charging infrastructure in your policies and plans. You need to address it in your development regulations. You need to address it in your administrative processes, which are things like permits and how those get issued. You need to address it in your local programs that you, you have in your communities that, that are kind of there to help achieve community goals and economic development. And you need to do it in your own public sector investment. These are the five kind of things you need to do in order to be ready for and to help foster the EV ready um, world. So let's kind of go through those a little bit more detail. What does it mean to have an EV ready comprehensive plan? Um, really, you need to uh, identify the public benefits of EV use and the market transformation, and you need to acknowledge the role that local government can play to overcome market barriers. This is the kind of thing that communities need to have in their comprehensive plans this year as you develop them um, and move forward in the metropolitan area, and a few communities outside the metropolitan area that are also doing their comprehensive plans. So um, in particular, we have some, some strategies and policies and targets, examples that you can find. These are all actually on the uh, these examples are, are may can be found on the regional indicator initiative website under the energy planning tab. It addresses um, a broad, wide variety of energy goals and targets that local governments can incorporate in their comprehensive plans. These are the ones that are specific to EVs. Things like make sure your public and private infrastructure accommodates and encourages use of electric and autonomous vehicles. That's another kind of component of the forward-looking world. Make sure your city fleets are 100% are zero emission vehicles or carbon fuels. That's a goal. That's a long-term goal saying, where do we want to be in 20 years? We want to be to this point or our, our, electric, our city fleet. Um, really working with corporate and institutional fleets to make sure that they transition to electric power. Um, making the community EV ready with electric and vehicle, electric vehicle charging stations in every public and private parking lot by 2025. That's an example of a target. Um, you know, a goal is something that's a little bit more broad in general. Without without a year on it, a target would have a year on it, and we encourage you to have both those kinds of things in your comprehensive plan. Um, second piece, development regulations. Um, it's, it's, it's addressing these kinds of things in the public sector, electric vehicles is important, but unless you're also addressing the private sector, you're not going to achieve your goals, because that's where most of the fleet is, right? Um, make sure that your development regulations are addressing the varied forms of EV charging infrastructure, because they're, it, they're not all the same, and, they, we, and we need a variety of different types. You need to set minimum standards that recognize these different types of patterns in your different types of land uses, and to set standards that facilitate EV market expansion without committing to specific charging technologies. And this is pretty important because this is a very rapidly evolving thing and we don't want to commit to a particular technology in your development regulation because in five years it may be different. But you can, there are, are ways and techniques you can use in your development regulations in order to get to these, um, to accommodate this without making that kind of a commitment. And some of the kind of things that you can do in your development regulations and we're actually going to hear uh, at least one example of that um, uh, uh, in, in uh, later presentation is to um, use things like incentive regulations, parking standards, public, uh, um, I'm sorry, planned unit development requirements um, to incorporate and or require EV, stand, uh, EV charging infrastructure into private sector development. Um, City of St. Paul, 
city of St. Louis Park. Um, I don't know, is that design? They have a green building standard? It's on our agenda. For okay, it's on the agenda. I thought so. Um, green building standards are one place where we see EV, sta EV standards being incorporated into private development regulations, into the city's development regulations for private um, sector investment. Um, that you can um, you can choose uh, optional regulatory paths because you can't change the building code on your own, but you can create an opportunity in your zoning code or your development regulations uh, that, that has a higher standard for things like EV infrastructure. You can change your parking standards to accommodate or require EV infrastructure. You can use your complete street standards to, again, um, address or require or provide incentives for um, EV infrastructure to be installed. Um, and it kind of, I just went, had to put this up there at some point, so I put it into here. These are the different types of infrastructure, or different types of land uses, and different types of applications. Um, and most people here probably have heard that, you know, there's different ways to charge an EV. You have a level one, a level two, and a level three kind of charger. Um, level one is the kind of thing that we typically see that you just plug into an ordinary wall outlet to charge your vehicle. A lot of people in, do this in their homes. It's an appropriate charging infrastructure to use in a home setting because you're going to have it there overnight for a long period of time, even though it charges slowly. Level two is a more rapid. It requires a 240 volt um, uh, uh, installation. This is something that we, we would like to see cities encouraging new residential development to have a, a, a 220 volt um, uh, line run out to the garage so that a level two charger could be accommodated there, but it's particularly important for any kind of a commercial application. When you want to have EV charging in a parking lot for where your employees are or even where your customers are, you want to have at least a level two charger. And then the level three is the DC fast charger. This is a lot more complicated, a lot more expensive, but it's the kind of thing that you need to see when you when somebody wants to, to, uh, to fill up in 20 minutes, right? Um, or, or in the future, they're talking about even faster charge, charge rates. Um, it is something, it is the kind of charging that you want to see at a, at a gas station or in your transportation corridors. Um, so all three of these need to be accommodated. You need to think about your development regulations in terms of all three of these types of chargers and what you want to see and where, where they are most appropriate. Um, third step, administrative and permitting practices. This is something where um, uh, is not going to be, a, I don't think, a big problem for EVs is, is how you issue permits, things like electric and building permits, but it's always a good thing to provide clarity in this, that you don't want someone having to pull building permits unnecessarily or having unnecessary standards for pulling permits in order to put in EV infrastructure. You want to make sure what's reasonable, but in terms of protecting safety and, and um, uh, and, and, and accessibility standards, but you don't want to have overly burdensome permitting processes. You want to reduce the time spent acquiring permits. You want to make the permit process transparent and predictable. And you do want to look at things like permitting that may come associated with using public right-of-ways to install infrastructure. Uh, local program um, is something that I, I think is particularly interesting, and I think that this is, this is, but it's sometimes the hardest leap for local governments to really get to, is what can you do to really help the private sector um, um, make this investment. Uh, the kind of things that local governments can do. You can install public EV infrastructure, charging infrastructure in your public sector parking lots. So at City Hall and at the community center and things like that, you can put that, you can put in the charging infrastructure there, make sure that it's public and that people can use it. Uh, you, can, you can provide financing or other financial assistance to businesses in order for them to install EV charging infrastructure in their parking lots and in their parking ramps. You can promote financial and environmental benefits, just education as a, when, 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 the, when the EV companies, when the car companies say, we have a great product here, everyone says, oh, that's just advertising. When the local government says, this is really good for our community and helps us achieve our goals, that's a trusted source of information, it has a bigger impact. You can co-promote this kind of thing and to do things like participate in these bulk buy um, opportunities for citizens and businesses uh, to, to uh, take advantage of those as a promotional effort. Um, and of course, you can encourage um, EV, the development of fast charging level three infrastructure in your transportation portals. Um, this, is, this is a pretty important. Now, who here 
What are the other cities here? Who has an economic development program in your city? Right? Show of hands. Everybody has economic development programs. This is economic development. Just think of it as another component of your economic development programs. You provide financing to businesses for other things. Why not for EV development of EV infrastructure? This is not a new thing. This is just an application of an existing program and structure that you have to a new type of economic development. And then finally, of course, we have providing leadership. This is the kind of this is the, the, the principle and the point that um, cities uh, are saying, if we're going to ask other people to do this, we need to do it ourselves. And the good thing here is that local governments, because they're probably going to be around for a while, you know, it's not, you're not going to go away, you can make long-term business decisions and, and that, 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 are, that are societally uh, beneficial. Um, it is actually cheaper, of course, in the, in the long run already for, to use EVs rather than other kinds of light-duty vehicles. They are the cheapest vehicle to own and operate over time already. And it's just going to get more so in the future. You should be looking at your fleets and saying, where are all the places that we can actually use electric vehicles? Now, we don't quite have an electric vehicle garbage pickup truck, you know, or, uh, you know, road equipment yet. Um, but we do have other applications. You might not want to. There are a few uh, police departments that have actually incorporated electric vehicles into their fleet. But probably not all the police cars are, should be electric vehicles. There are some limitations yet. Um, however, those, um, those are the places where you're going to put downward pressure on taxes by making these kinds of investments. These are good investments for taxpayers, and you should be doing it. Um, purchasing EVs for fleet use, installing char charging infrastructure at your fleet maintenance facilities, uh, participating in renewable energy charging programs for EV charging, um, so your emissions are genuinely zero um, for your cars, uh, and uh, considering innovations such as EV charging with solar energy arrays, I have to throw that in there because we're getting ready to start a program associated with this and just uh, probably within the month. So, and you'll be hearing your bottom at that point. Um, so anyway, th that's, those are the five principles. And um, I wanted to kind of put this up. This is a, 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 a graphic from a study that was done by the Renew National Renewable Energy Labs on how much charging infrastructure do we need in our country and where do we need it in order to accommodate a, um, an electric vehicle fleet that's approximately 30% of the total. So they kind of, they look and they look at several different numbers for that um, and some sensitivity. Uh, but what they discovered was that uh, they, they, there's around, uh, I think it was, for yes, charging stations, direct um, um, uh, DC fast chargers. Uh, they in, in in the interstate highway corridors, we need around 400 at least in order to accommodate um, that level of market penetration for EVs um, in a way that kind of matches the way people's driving patterns are. So. You think about that 400 that's not a that's not a big number that's a minimum number but it's, it's not that big of a number um, when you look at what you're going to need in other places it's going to be 10 times that in within the cities you're going to need 10 times that number of, of charging stations and when you start looking at kind of uh, things like um, level 2 chargers the number gets even bigger so what they have done is saying most of the charging is going to happen at the local level. And so it's at the local level where we're going to need most of the charging infrastructure. It's critical to have the interstate kind of highway charging in order to accommodate long, long uh, drives. Most of it's going to happen at the residential level. And they actually assumed after looking at the data that 88% of passenger vehicles will be charged at the home. Okay. 88%, I should say, 88% of the charging will happen at the home rather than other places. That means that every single household needs to have access to electric vehicle charging. So what are the strategies that, that cities can use? Um, this is out of the, an example uh, that we, we use in our um, logo path. This is the regional indicators. Um, Plant energy planning recommendations. We have a, a strategy section in our workbook um, where we, we 
ask people, rather than to think about kind of specific programs, to first think about you know, the strategies that local governments can do in, in, the, in, in terms of four types of tools. You can do things, encouragement, that encourage people to act consistent with your goals. You can use incentives, where you say, if you do it, we'll provide you something. In order, in that way, we'll all benefit. <coughs> you can use regulation. You can actually require certain things that that uh, private businesses and, and, and households in your community do things consistent with your regulation. And you can do public demonstration um, and provide leadership in the public sector. So those are the kind of four general categories of tools that you have as local governments in order to bring about these kind of uh, desired outcomes. And if examples of that for electric vehicles are what, what is an encouragement thing that a local government can do? Well, you can just educate your your um, educate your your businesses and your households uh, on the life cycle cost, the public charging options, the purchasing options for electric vehicles. If they hear it from the local government, they're going to believe it more than if they hear it in an advertisement. What are the life cycle costs of an electric vehicle? Um, you can publicly recognize and kind of promote businesses that install uh, electric vehicles at their, uh, in their parking lots and in their parking facilities and accommodate customers that, in that way or employees. Um, what are some of the, what are things, examples of incentives that you can do? You can have EV charging infrastructure um, as an optional amenity with, within your planned unit development regulation. Or you can create a, a bulk buy program for your citizens or businesses to, to purchase electric vehicles. You can work with your municipal utility, if you have one, on electric vehicle charging rates. Uh, that's actually a very important component here that I've been kind of ignoring, because, but it, it is a, uh, something that's going to have to be done. Uh, regulation, we've already talked about some of these things. We're going to hear a couple examples of these um, uh, in presentations in just, in just a few minutes, as well as the public demonstration and leadership, where we're going to have, uh, we actually have, we're going to launch a uh, um, an effort to, here to get people to participate in the leadership component um, in a cohort of cities that Diana will talk about at the end of the program. So these are kind of the four buckets of strategy that that um, you need to think about in terms of achieving your desired goals. So um, that's the end of my presentation, and you're going to hear the really interesting stuff from the example. <laughs> I beat the time, so. So why don't we just take a few minutes to do questions? And I forgot to say, I said I was tweeting, but on the agenda, it's the hashtag in case you want to get in there and tweet yourself or retweet. So questions? Yes. Can Can you speak up a little bit? Sorry. Oh. Can you repeat the question for the webinar? Yeah, the question was how many how many cities have mayors that drive EVs as kind of a public de demonstration, and how many cities have incorporated EVs into their fleets already? And I think we're going to have a few examples of that. We will. I mean, some of the cities will talk about that. I think there's about, well, Fran could probably answer that question about how many cities have EVs in their fleet, like four or five. I believe so, but I don't have a, a necessarily right. accurate count. Yeah. And we, some of those cities are on the panel. We'll talk about it. I am not aware of any mayors and Mayor um, Falcon Heights back there. He would be the one that I would expect that would be, and I'm not calling you out at all. Um, but he is a one-vehicle family. So, any bikes, but um, so I don't know. Are there? City uh, not mayor, but I'm a recent member. Okay. Yeah. City, city council, council members. So, we just need to get you to run for mayor. That's it. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, that's, like that's <laughs> excellent idea. Okay. So, I don't, know that we, I don't know that we know any mayors for sure that do. Okay. okay another question. Yeah. Um, th and this may come up later. You said uh, residential is where 80, or at home is where 88% uh, of charging will occur, but there are a lot of homes that are not um, available to charge. People don't have standalone garage, or they don't have garage space, whatever. Lots of reasons why uh, there's a large majority of people who can't 
are there strategies to deal with that? Yes, and 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 this is one of this is kind of it's very tricky when you talk about a, you know a single family home. Well, that seems easy, right? Because we most of them have garages. Most of the garages have electric power. But when you talk about an apartment, it becomes a little more difficult. I live in an apartment building, <laughs> right? and I, I have an electric vehicle. And I didn't couldn't buy one though until I went to the uh, went to the ownership and, and said I have an underground parking garage. And there's there's I said, do you have any with with uh, plug-ins? And they had six out of 180. They had six that had a plug-in right nearby. Um, and so I said, okay, well, that, I can buy an electric vehicle. But that's not a given. And that's why when you do development, when you think about how, you have, how development occurs in your community, it's important to make sure that places like apartments have EV you know, charging like power put in someplace. Then you have people who rent um, in, in places that don't have, uh, or, or um, places that don't have garages, um, and people who don't have even parking in, in the building and they're parking out on the street. And there are strategies and there are examples across the nation we can look at for how you put EV charging into the public right of way in places that allow for um, people who don't have off street parking to still charge. Um, as, uh, yes? I'd like to have a follow up comment. I'll say now. You can think about for the city, incentives to encourage all the other supply charging stations, grocery store, go there, pay enough to a half an hour or so. Yeah. So, so there are there are strategies, but you're you're right that it's a it's a tough nugget to get to, and it's actually really important from an equity standpoint. To address how we make sure that people who, who rent and who park on the street can get to this because electric vehicles are the cheapest form of transportation in a personal vehicle that you can have and the most reliable. So lots of benefits. Laura. I'll just say a follow-up to that. I was just reading yesterday um, an article about a German company which has figured out how to plug into Vital and has an app and then people I charge um, Oh, that's an interesting combination. Yeah, yeah. You have LEDs, so your power goes down. You put in the plug in the poles. The, okay, yeah. Brian, so you mentioned a lot of people are working on their comp plans now. They've heard your presentation and they're looking for three or four bullet points that they can sort of cut and paste into their comp plan. You know, what, is there a resource to find that as easy as possible? Like what are the, what specific language to put into us? Yes, we have examples of the goals and I had some of them up here on the screen. At, if you go to the Regional Indicators Initiative website, the Energy Planning tab on that website, and that there is a whole list of comprehensive planning um, tools that you can use that address all forms of energy, but if you go to the, the sample comprehensive planning goals, I can't remember exactly if that's the right title, but it has a four-page document there that includes example goals for EVs. We'll include that um, uh, link with the follow-up email. And uh, Jennifer? So, um, since we have a little people in our kind of comp plan, we have a couple people on our comp plan task force that they're residents that have been asking about autonomous vehicles and how we're going to address that. Mm. And so, you know, Obviously, we don't know a timeline for that, so we, our response has been, you know, that we'll include language that says we're flexible and, you know, that we can adapt to that. But at the same, like, I have a, I have a relative who works for Uber on, on that program specifically, and although he won't tell anyone a timeline, I mean, it just seems like it's probably going to happen before and it's part of the comp plan. So I was just curious, is anyone addressing anything like that, or are we just keeping things general because we really don't know the timeline? Uh, and, and I, yeah, the autonomous vehicle is, you know, we talked about how rapidly the EV stuff is changing. <laughs> oh yeah, I know. This is this is like the you know, it's, it's really kind of a scary thing. So the best to keep it general and yeah, yeah. It, 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 keep worried about like the road waste and stuff. Right, and and I think actually you know, didn't Golden Valley actually make some changes to your way you're striping the streets or something? Yeah, and I think our it's 
far as policy, we're just saying something like plan and design and accommodate autonomous vehicles. And then we're going to rely a lot on MINDAP work because they have, my understanding is they have a full time staff working on autonomous vehicles and how that might change their regulations. So we're going to kind of rely on them since we don't really have enough ability to do a lot in house. Yeah, so great question, and, 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 and the Met Council is also doing a lot of work on this and trying to figure out what the impacts. One or two more quick questions. Oh. I'm, a, I'm going to defer to cities, Phil. <laughs> Columbia Heights. Um, Donna Schmidt from Columbia Heights. I have five neighbors that have just bought an EV in this last year, wow. but that's been because the tax incentive is going away. So are you still thinking even with that tax incentive gone? that people are still going to continue that upward trend like you were talking about? It got put back in the bill. It's oh, not, it, yeah. yeah. It, 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 oh. Yes, it, it did, but, but the, the, the trends that you see here uh, assume that eventually that will go away. Yeah. Um, and because the, uh, the, the tax, it provides a great incentive now, but as, right. as costs continue to come down, the competitiveness of the EVs is, is getting more and more obvious, um, and that will, over time, swallow up and you know, the, 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 the need for a, a subsidy, I guess. So the, all, all those forecasts assume uh, are done under the assumption that tax, tax credits will go possible away. All right, in the back. Do you have any recommendations on how to convince uh, decision makers who are on the fence of supporting EV charging that they should have some sort of decision makers that say, we should just let private business uh, take care of this whole EV charging thing, and then we have some others that say, hey, well, we need help. Then our real help. Yeah, and um, the, the development market responds to current conditions or historic conditions. They're not very good at responding to future conditions. Um, and that's where city governments really have a role to play. Because when, when, a, when a housing developer comes in and says, we want to do this this way in our community, they're looking at what current market is. They want to sell today. But when they leave, when they go away, they leave you the houses. They stay with the community. And so the community has an interest in making sure that those buildings are built in order to accommodate the future's tenants as well and the future owners as, as well as the current. And that's the one problem we have with development markets is that, and that local governments have a specific role to play, is that markets respond to conditions today. Markets are not very good at responding to conditions in 10 years. Uh, the, the, I would look, I, I, they need to think about development as infrastructure in their community the same way they would um, sewer lines and roads and those kinds of things. So housing is just another form of infrastructure. And you don't, as I kind of tried to make the point earlier, you don't build a road um, that's going to be around for 40 years to the size of volume that you, you would see today. You build it to what you're going to see in 20 years. So I'm thinking that revised prediction. That could be, yes. I think, think so. I, it had that impression on me. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Brian. Yeah. One, of the, one of the things I've asked the cities to talk about is, um, depending on which step or level that they're at for their decision-making and process with electric vehicles, um, to share what was the decision-making process. How did you convince people? Who are the deciders? You know, all of that, because I think that is a one really key question that a lot of folks have is how, how, how did you get people to say yes? How do you, how do you get them to yes? Um, uh, so um, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. So now we're going to move on to the city panel. Can I have control? Here we go. <laughs> I want control. There you go. <laughs> um, so Maja Bean is a Green Corps member serving with the city of Edina. As a Green Corps, we, we have a couple of them in the room. It's a very exciting program. Um, and uh, when we asked Edina to come and do this, they said she's the one. Um, so she is going to be here and talk about what uh, the city of Edina has been doing. And I'll just leave her bio up here, and then I'll let you do your slides. Turn right here. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, as Diana mentioned, I am a Green Corps member of the city of Edina. I've been there since September, and I've been learning about the fleet and uh, one of the vehicles that I've been studying um, is the electric vehicle, uh, is um, our all-electric Nissan Leaf, and um, trying to look for opportunities where more electric vehicles might fit in within the plant. So this is a picture of the Nissan Leaf. Um, 
as you can see, it's housed in the public works building and charging infrastructure is right there, which is one of the reasons that we could invest in this vehicle is because there, there was that, um, the possibility of that infrastructure being installed. Um, other things that led to this decision making process was the fact that <clears throat> DINA has an initiative to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 30% by 2025 and 80% by 2050. So to be able to achieve these goals, um, electric vehicles are really something that they have to consider. And um, at the same time, um, this vehicle was acquired in August 2013. At the same time, there were a lot of new hires within the engineering department, and they knew that they needed to purchase a new uh, vehicle. And if they hadn't purchased the lease, it would have been a light duty truck, such as the GMC Sierra. And um, I, the other thing that was also happening at the same time was that the NPCA had a $5,000 grant available. And so we had a city engineer who looked into the process and um, he created um, a spreadsheet using the alternative vehicle decision tool from the University of Minnesota Extension. So he plugged in the information and compared it to if we were using a conventional vehicle. And as you can see, it was about 50% less expensive to acquire an electric versus a conventional vehicle. So he gathered all of this information, he gathered up um, the grant information, and he presented it, it to his supervisor, who was the director of engineering, who then went on to um, present it to the city manager and eventually the city council, where um, it was approved. And this actually was the one that was actually um, submitted with the grant application to the NPCA. And since then, um, it's been in the fleet for uh, four and a half years. There's been a couple of different things that have happened. One of the main things that they've noticed is that they had assumed that it was going to be driven for about 15,000 miles a year. It's only being driven about 5,000 miles a year. And there are a couple of reasons for that. One is that Edina is a pretty compact city. So there's really not very far that the vehicle has to be driven. The other is that um, in the summer, it's a lot busier than it is in the winter, just because their project's starting up, their interns working there, and um, in the winters, it's mostly just going back and forth from City Hall or to other meetings. Um, it hasn't had any issues in the winter. As you can see, this was taken, um, I think, the second week of December, right after we had the snowfall that made all of the traffic really um, you know, stand still, and um, it didn't have a problem. It, um, because it doesn't go very far, we haven't had a problem with it not starting up somewhere else, and um, it's even come to City Hall on some of those very cold days and not had any issues. Uh, the other thing is that um, the vehicle, because of the way that it's branded, it has the City of Edina logo on it, the commitment to sustainability is very apparent within the community, and um, there have been people who have actually commented on that, that they do like the fact that we are investing in electric vehicles and looking at the possibilities for electric vehicles. So, oh, and uh, the other thing I wanted to mention was the fact that even though it's not being used as much as expected, it's still cheaper to use than um, if we were to go with a light duty truck, and also the fact that in terms of emission savings, it is 77% more efficient in terms of emissions than if we were to go with a trunk, and it's still efficient, 51% um, savings if compared to a small vehicle such as a Ford Focus. And so since then, um, there are a couple of lessons that were learned, and we're looking at, uh, said I am looking at the future opportunities for electric vehicles in the city of Edina fleet, and. One of the lessons that we learned was the fact that there really needs to be someone who's committed to it and who's willing to take on the legwork for it. And since then, there have been a couple of hybrids um, introduced into the fleet. The Prius C, um, there are six of those within the building inspections department, and then we newly acquired uh, just a normal Toyota Prius hybrid into um, the public works department. And the reason that they decided to go with a hybrid instead of with an electric vehicle is because, well, as you can see, they're parked outside in the snow. There really isn't a place where these can be housed indoors, and where, uh, to have charging infrastructure there is um, more, you know, it's logistically difficult and very costly, but that is something that um, I will also be looking into to see 
you know, what the possibilities are, and uh, it's something that's been explored before as well by the city. And so in this case, the previous three hybrids, they were introduced well because of the fact that um, we don't have the infrastructure available, and also because the person who is, who made the decision, the chief building official for the city of Edina, drove a Prius in his um, personal life. So he knew that these were reliable vehicles, and that really did help make the decision. But again, he took on all of that initiative to do so. And um, so also looking into the future, we're looking at other departments that might be able to uh, have electric vehicles within their fleet. And the fire department is one that have they've been enthusiastic about the possibility because again, they have that indoor infrastructure. But um, trying to find a vehicle that would you know, fulfill all of their needs because we're looking for them for the fire inspectors and they do carry a lot of equipment. So finding one that would be able to carry that equipment while still being cost effective has been difficult. So that is something that I am currently working on them with and trying to see what options they have either in terms of electric vehicles or in terms of hybrid vehicles. Um, that is all I had for you today and I think questions are going to be at the end. Thank you. Thank you so much. So next we have Tim Hammer, and I think Eric um, is going to provide. Eric Cruzen from Connectus is going to provide an assist. I'm not sure. I think I think Tim's totally capable of doing this, but you know, but we'll we'll, we'll give you an assist if you'd like. Um, so um, Tim is with the City of Coon Rapids, and I'll just let him take it over. And we'll again we'll do questions at the end with the whole panel, so you can talk to them. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So um, in Coon Rapids, I'm yes. In the infancy stage of all of this, um, I think Brian mentioned comprehensive planning, uh, being the public works director, clean facilities falls under that authority. Um, and so we have an interesting opportunity with Connexus kind of right in our backyard uh, as a local supplier of energy. So as we looked at the, the 2018 comp planning, we looked at our fleet, we spent a lot of 27 kind of right sizing what's there. What, what vehicles do we need for the purposes we need? Um, and we spent a lot of time clearing out excess surplus and, and kind of right sizing where we need to be. But things change all the time. We certainly understand that and the needs change as we go on. So not only did we want to look at kind of the environmental sustainability, the financial sustainability of, of the budget process, um, as well as the infrastructure planning as, as we look to go forward. So um, after we looked at getting down to that right size of, I guess, currently in 2017 as we go into 2018, we've got about 108 vehicles in our fleet. And we're spending somewhere on the magnitude of 250000 on fuel uh, on an annual basis. So you get to that budget process every year, and you've got this 10-year rotation program, replacement program, or less for police vehicles, and you've got a lot of that... Um, concern from police fire we, we maintain to the extent of practical all of our vehicles you know the jetters and the fire trucks and the, the larger equipment we certainly can't do that but um, the police have all their gadgets the fire department has all their gadgets all of these power and energy needs and, and storage that just don't seem to be available out there but they were able to kind of get on board with this idea of let's pick 20 across the city let's go couple fire couple police uh, I think uh, the previous speaker inspections, assessing, those seem to be the, the easier ones that low mileage, seasonal usage, uh, lots of downtime in the evening, and um, it's really then trying to build the facilities that can house that and the infrastructure for the charging station. So you get into that budget time and sometimes you've got big years where you're spending you know, over a million dollars on equipment. Some years you're down and you're trying to look at those peaks and valleys and so you start horse trading. Well, I'm going to get rid of this one. How about you? You can take that one. And so you get all these old Crown Vicks out there in, in the inspection <laughs> arena. And um, I'm sure not too distant future, it's going to be the, the chargers. Um, but as we look at that, you kind of get to why, why do I always got to be the hand-me-down? Why do I always got to get somebody else's leftovers? Well, we can put a few extra tens of thousands of dollars away for next year, and we'll just... Um, try to get by with what we have. But when you start thinking of reliability, when you need it and it's not working, when you're um, considering your maintenance costs start to go up and you're begging and borrowing from other people and, and you're renting and you're just trying to figure out a way really to, to manage those dollars. So Connexus um, came to us actually in this situation and said, 
we're looking for a, a large fleet user, uh, somebody who has uh, some flexibility from heavy duty vehicles down to lighter use vehicles. And um, so we decided to work with Eric and his group to say, hey, let's look at what opportunities might exist. If, if this is the need for this division or department, what will work? What, what options are out there for us compared to what we're using today? So again, we're, we're just learning this as we go. And, and I am gonna pass it to Eric, <laughs> but I'll certainly handle the questions. And uh, we're working right now for about a six month period, looking at 20 of our vehicles, um, tracking their runtime, downtime, all of that sort of thing. And then we can kind of pull out a menu and go, here's what we use today. Here are several options we have in the future. Here are the cost perspectives and breakdowns for that compared to what we're currently using today. Um, then how might that work for us? Can, can we get some of those people off the fence to say, yeah, maybe I can work with this. Maybe this is better environmentally than it is financially today. And, and how do you kind of set that forward? So with that, I will turn it briefly over to Eric and then I will be available for questions at the end. Perfect, thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Appreciate being having the opportunity to be here. How many of you have a sustainability plan for your fleet in place? <laughs> not, not many. <laughs> That's perfectly understandable for two for two reasons. One, uh, there are not many electric vehicles available in all the classifications that can be. And the second was it's a complex question to answer. One of the reasons why we partnered with a third party to help us analyze fleets, provide a tool, and that's really why I'm here is to talk about the partnership that we have uh, to work together toward this common end goal of improving the, the uh, footprint, the carbon footprint of a fleet, but also learn about the process to determine what tools are effective. Um, oops, I jumped ahead too much. So what we partnered with uh, a company out of Canada, Fleet Karma, to work with them using their tools to evaluate several fleets in territory. Um, City Coon Rapids is the first. We are working with them to look at 20 of their vehicles, as, as uh, Tim pointed out, in a different format. We were trying to help them and others not make the mistake that we made as a cooperative, as a youth electric provider. If you bought an electric vehicle three years ago and said, let's see where we can put it. How would you utilize it? And then after three years, that vehicle has 10,000 miles on it. And it's a hybrid. So it, it points to the general fact that if you go about it in that format without really saying, how do we optimize an electric vehicle in an application, you're going to waste a lot of time. <laughs> so what we've done, and again, I said there's a complex question. These are a number of questions that come up as you look at your fleets regarding what is the most beneficial utilization of an electric vehicle or hybrid in our fleet? And you have to really be able to answer those questions and come up with what's the best total cost of ownership approach for vehicles. So we uh, embrace the fleet karma approach. I've run into them at several different conferences. And really, it's a three-step process of looking at a fleet. And that's what I'm here to share with you today. First, the, the key is each individual vehicle is driven differently, has a different duty requirement. So the fleet karma approach utilizes telematics, a device that plugs into the OED2 port under the dash to record daily duty cycles. And we'll do that for all the vehicles. We'll record that information for the period of time. In our case, a, a roughly a six-month time frame because we want to get a good representation of typical driving, winter driving, summer driving, or spring driving. It captures all that information in Fleet Karma. Oh, by the way, the, the telematics device is a cellular device that is submitting that information to Fleet Karma on a per second or two seconds basis. So it's continually recording the fleet information um, drive time, and then they gather all that information at the end of that, the time frame of data collection, then they do an analysis. Fleet Karma's strength is they came out of the world of design of uh, drivetrains for conventional vehicles. They have the ability to model all these electric vehicle drivetrains against the particular vehicle you have in mind. So they can do the analysis, do a modeling of drivetrain comparing your current vehicle against options, hybrid or battery electric, and then create a report that summarizes all this for you. This is what the duty cycle, an example of duty cycle looks like. The green bars are trips. Black is dwell time, or time where an electric vehicle or hybrid could recharge. So as an example, here was a longer trip. 
for a vehicle in the fleet and record and the information will be recorded and documented as well as you'll also see a map of where it'll actually uh, give you an idea of the uh, typical uh, commuter travel or drive tra channel that drive uh, distances and corridors that your fleet operates under. And then this is the modeling. The top is the electric vehicle, uh, the, the standard vehicle, the Ford Fusion that was the model or data collection through the telematics. And below are three electric vehicles that are simulated for operations to say, okay, here's how they compare. You see over here, there's no gasoline, but full battery electric Nissan Leaf, and the other two are hybrids. So you get a sense of how they compare operationally and say, yeah, they can, in fact, perform in that basis. You're given a final report that outlines what the potential savings in dollars, greenhouse gas emissions, gasoline reduction, et cetera, uh, and a statewide wide uh, summary of all of that. So this is kind of what it looks like. Here is an example of a fleet analysis that's done, different vehicles. These dark grays are saying, based upon the duty cycle and the type of vehicle, there is not a good electric or hybrid replacement for that vehicle yet. Uh, the others show that there are opportunities for them to, to save, and this is what the annual cost of ownership savings would be like. So it gives you, unlike we did, buy an electric vehicle and try to place it in the fleet, it says here's the best opportunities for you to fully, fully utilize the electric or hybrid vehicle benefits to its maximum, to get the maximum savings out of that conversion. And so again, best fit vehicle, and you get examples of those on a per vehicle basis based upon the, the unit idea that was data, where the data was collected. Um, and also talks about infrastructure. I, I, I can't help, Brian's presentation was, was terrific and I appreciated that, particularly as the infrastructure side of things. We as a, a utility struggle on the same issues for, for some similar reasons and a lot of other challenging reasons from a distribution balancing and design standpoint. But the problem we run into most often is the chicken and the egg scenario on charging infrastructure. I was at a conference in California last year and again this year, and you hear the same issue every year, chicken and egg. Right now in Minnesota, DC fast chargers utilize 5% load factor for those DC fast chargers. In other words, if you want to lose money fast, put it in a DC fast charger. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm hoping that this will do, and it may be a footprint or an opportunity for you all to consider as well, Every fleet, you've got a group of vehicles that are going to be converted to electric or operating electric. That becomes a good location for a charger because now you have utilization opportunity there. So if you're looking at how do we deploy a public charging infrastructure, if you build a fleet around electric or plug-in hybrids, there's your opportunity to have a better cash flow, a better utilization, and it's on your property. So it's something that, that we would certainly work together to accomplish. So those are the three pieces of the, pro of the process for us and something that you know, want to give you an example to consider in the future. And I'll pull questions to the end as well. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, thanks. All right, we're going to keep slipping along here. Um, next we have up from the city of Minneapolis, um, John Sharfbillig, um, who's going to talk about some of their vehicles and they have a couple of full electric vehicles. So very exciting. There we go. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thank you. Um, thanks for having me come and talk today. The city of Minneapolis has about 2,500 vehicles in our fleet, of which uh, 1,400, 1,500 of them are on road vehicles. Out of that, 600 of them are law enforcement vehicles. So you can see our on road light duty fleet is the biggest crux of what we have in the city of Minneapolis. A couple of things we've done in Minneapolis is we put together a team as how do we make our fleet greener. The people that are involved in it is our fleet service division, our environmental and sustainability office. And we rotate this around on how and what types of equipment we need to get into the fleet and what types of uh, targets we're trying to hit. One of the things that we do in the city of Minneapolis, we will not buy a vehicle that doesn't meet a smart, smart way uh, credentialing and it has a minimum rating of seven. So our standard vehicle in the city of Minneapolis, for example, is either a Ford Focus or a hybrid uh, Ford Fusion. Uh, the other thing is we're working really hard is to reduce our fleet size. We've reduced in the last five years about 2%. The other thing we're doing is we're looking at alternative fuels. 
Uh, we did a study on CNG. I'm going to talk a little bit about our electric vehicle study that we just did. Uh, we've done several things to reduce our use of fossil fuels. CNG, and Brian talked about this earlier today, one of the things that we're seeing in the city of Minneapolis, 50% of our carbon is coming out of vehicles in our transportation sector. And so one of the things that we're doing, we have what's called the Golden Triangle, which is in the south part of the city. We have nursing homes, we have schools, we have daycare centers and everything, and a lot of heavy industry. It's one of our most polluted areas. That's one of the areas that we're looking at putting our electric vehicles and electric infrastructure in to try to reduce the air quality or better the air quality in that area. One of the things that we've done is we've put together a green fleet policy in the city. The green fleet policy has been in place for about the last four and a half to five years. We're in the process of updating it right now. One of the things, again, optimizing our fleet, encourage the staff to do equal driving. We're spending money to train our folks to how to drive a conventional vehicle, not rapid start, easy braking, and how to use it to be more environmentally friendly by the tailpipe emissions. And then all of our new vehicles we're looking at is what can we replace it with that is cleaner? Can we use an electric? Should we look at a CNG? We've actually put in our sanitation and recycling department two uh, electric hybrid uh, class seven trucks this year to be used to pick up recycling. The city of Minneapolis has a climate action plan. 2025 is the business as usual, is if we don't do anything, 2025, if we start incorporating in some of our electric vehicles, you can see the dramatic drop that we'll start seeing in the greenhouse gas emissions. Every year I'm required to provide to city council where we are with greenhouse gas emissions. We provide a report to them on every one of our vehicles and where we're seeing most of the reduction in our greenhouse gases. We did an electric vehicle study, and I only have one copy of it here, but it is online. And we worked with ACOM to come up with how do we bring more electric vehicles into the city? What is it that we need to do to get more electric vehicles in here? And we took a balanced approach. For every X number of vehicles, we need X number of infrastructure for charging to bring it in. One of the things is, is we can get all the vehicles we need in electric, but if we can't charge them, the vehicles are going to do us no good. We're working with the state of New York right now on some of the Chevy Bolts that we bought to set it up for parking enforcement so we'll be able to put lights in different types of attachments on there and be able to use it for an emergency vehicle. Not a frontline law enforcement, but our parking control. So we'll be able to actually run lights on it. Our preliminary tests are seeing, we get about 2, 220 to 225 on the electric vehicle on a charge. Putting the lights and everything on it drops us down to 200 miles. Average mileage daily traffic of our traffic control people, about 125 miles. We still have 75 miles capacity left in the city. So this has been a real, you know, you were talking about how do you improve your city council? This really made a big difference for our city council on why we need to go forward. One of the things that came out of our strategy here is the key assumptions. It's going to not happen overnight. It's going to take us about 10 years. In one of the plans, it wants by 2027, city of Minneapolis to be at 48% electric vehicles. And I think if I'm looking at my Ouija board, I think we're going to be somewhere in there where the city council wants us to head that direction. One of the other things is, you know, we keep hearing about we don't have, there's not enough battery life. We don't can't get enough distance. Well, here's what's happening in the industry. We just bought three Chevy Bolts. We're getting in this cool weather, and right now we're averaging 200 miles with them, running the heater radio, seat warmers, steering wheel heaters, everything into them, and we got them in date, what we call general population. They're being used by inspection. They're being used by the uh, council office. And so they're being used out and they're parked outside. We do have one that we use for people to try that is parked inside. That's parked with our Transit Connect when we drive, did drive many, drive Minnesota. Was that 2004, Fran? When we brought in the first electric connects in here, St. Paul, Minneapolis, and the airport, and I don't remember, there was one other, Ramsey County, were part of the Transit Connect. Matter of fact, that Transit Connect is still being used today. We average about 75 miles on a charge on it, and we use it for our perks running car. The other thing is what we're doing is we're comparing the electric 
output of the tailpipe looking at how can we use clean energy. We're working with Excel to look at getting buying only wind energy or solar energy so we can really reduce the sewer emissions for our vehicle. This is our five scenarios and you can see the in the red is the tons of carbon that we would reduce by just going in uh, using the formulas depending on which scenario we check. The first one is business as usual. That's the upper line. Sorry about that. That was the wrong button. Yep. Uh, this is business as usual, but this actually shows the amount of fuel savings we'll have and maintenance savings when we go total electric. One of the things that we're seeing in the electric vehicles, do they reduce costs? Yes. Do you still need brakes? Yep. That's the same as a regular vehicle. But the difference is, is you can put these in regen mode and we're seeing in the Transit Connect and in the LEAF that we have, we're seeing about twice the average life on the brakes because the regenerating actually breaks the vehicle. Plus it recharges the vehicle to get more life out of it. The other thing is if you're gonna do the repairs in-house, the training that needs to be done for your technicians and different things really change. So you need to be looking at going forward. The other thing is we're actually having some discussions right now to look at putting in an electric fire truck. And the electric fire truck, I think, is probably three to five years away, maybe maybe a little further, but I think it's really where you're gonna see it going. Tesla had introduced their uh, new over-the-road tractor this year, and they're being sold, and their first one to roll off the line in 2019. Cummings will be releasing a Class 8, which is like your snowplow trucks, for the marketplace in 2019. So it's moving at a really accelerated pace. Brian talked earlier about how fast it's changing. I was at a meeting the other day, and they're comparing the electric vehicle market to your cell phone. You know, in about, what was it, 10 years ago, we didn't even have the smartphone. That's how fast it's changing. They say in 10 years, we're not even going to recognize it. What's the driving factor of it is, if you look, China right now, 2013, no fossil fuel. Uh, same thing happening in Sweden by 2035. Uh, we also have the same thing going on in Brazil, and I believe it's uh, somewhere in uh, Europe, I believe it's Germany, it has the same thing. The other thing you start to see auto manufacturer and car manufacturers, everything will be electric assisted or full electric by 2020. So that ends my talk. Thank you. It's exciting to hear that um, the bulls are still getting 200 miles um, per charge in this weather. Um, that's incredible. So very exciting. Um, are there any other cities that have bulls? I know that the the um, state did a, a group purchase. So Woodbury, any other? B. B. Bolt. Elk River. Elk River. Okay. So um, now we have um, Emily from Golden Valley. She's going to take us in a little different direction, not talking about electric vehicles they have, but some, um, as Brian was talking about, kind of the incentives and, and looking at you know, how a city can put some um, things in place to help encourage um, or perhaps require um, some um, electric vehicle charging. So Emily, thank you. Thank you. So uh, my name is Emily. I've been at Golden Valley for three years. Uh, if I say things that don't make sense today, it's probably because I'm having a bit of a pregnancy brain. And I, <laughs> this morning, I took my dog's water, I filled it up, and I tried to put it in the fridge. So <laughs> I, hopefully I make sense this morning. I'm going to pass around a draft of our comprehensive plan. And we have two key documents that I want to talk about today. The first is our zoning code, and the second is our comprehensive plan. Um, when I talk about the zoning code, I'll talk about our planned unit development requirements with an amenity point system and our development agreements. And then with our comprehensive plan, we're writing a resilience and sustainability chapter, which we've never had before. So I just wanted to pass it around in case you're interested in seeing the general outline of that document. And then I uh, highlighted a few sections that are relevant to today's discussion. In the comprehensive plan, we have the policy plan, and then we have an implementation plan as well. Lastly, I just wanted to talk about how, for future consideration at our city, we're looking at a policy for um, our expectations for projects where the city is providing financial assistance. Let's go back here. 
So, plan unit developments are a really common tool that's used for planning in Golden Valley. Um, for those of you that are familiar with that zoning tool, uh, developers like to use them so that they can get around some of our typical zoning requirements, which are very old. Our zoning requirements are from generally the 1960s through the 80s. They don't necessarily contemplate developments that developers want to build today. So um, developers will often come in with a proposal that doesn't meet our standard zoning requirements. They want to do a planned unit development, which takes quite a bit of time to get through the process. It's six months usually, uh, but they see a lot of benefits in the flexibility of that. And so we have a lot of developers that use that tool. Actually, in 2013, when the housing market started to recover, we started approving a lot of housing, multifamily housing projects. Um, through about 2015. Um, in the two years, we approved as many multifamily units as we had in the whole city before in just a two-year period. So during that time, we realized that our PUD ordinance needed a lot of work and needed to have some readjustments. We also realized that planned unit developments are very highly negotiated by staff and the developers. But we had some newer staff that weren't really as good at those negotiation techniques yet. So we needed to really memorialize some of the priorities that the city had, get that in our code up front so that it's very clear with developers on day one that they come in that we're expecting certain things rather than kind of waiting for the negotiation to take place. We found that developers are very open to ideas at the very first meeting that they have with the city and every meeting they get a little more closed-minded on how much they're willing to bend to what the city wants. So. Getting it in writing ahead of time, they tend to read through that before they even come to the city. Getting that in their heads right away is definitely recommended. So we adapted an amenity point system, and you'll see a lot of different green um, step cities best practices found their way onto the list. A developer is required to get five points, and the five points are negotiated, so there's still some room there to discuss with the developer. Uh, green roof and um, lead certification and renewable energy are high on the list, as well as affordable housing, public open spaces. Each of these also accompany an explanation for what we mean when we say that, because of course developers will, some of them will want to do the least um, amount of work possible to get those points. And then on the next page I have here, some of our three, two, and one pointers. We have had some developers who try to just use all the one pointers, of course, <laughs> and we have the ability to just say, no, that's not what we're looking for. We have our electric vehicle charging station down at the <laughs> one point mark right now. We're trying to keep this list short so that our priorities get met. If you add too much to this list, then you you may not get exactly what you want. So we're actually going to remove a few. We, we, did, we started this in 2015, so two years later, we're going to remove some of those one pointers, not the electric vehicle one, but a couple others that we just feel are not important enough and the proposals we've gotten are just, it's underwhelming and we don't want people to keep using that. So we're going to remove uh, ex enhanced exterior lighting and a couple others. So this point system has worked um, pretty well. The major issue that we have with it is that it's only for our new planned unit developments. Well, we have over 50 planned unit developments in the city, and what's happening now is they were created so long ago that people are starting to amend them and make changes to them. And we're not requiring this point system for our amendments yet, because it just felt like it was a little too soon. Let's start with new PUDs, and then if it's working well and developers are open to it, we'll consider possibly a different list for amendments, because you know some of the things on that list really wouldn't be practical for someone who's just making adjustments to their site or to their building. So I think that'll be a next step for us. And I think we'll continue to um, amend our amenity point system based on what we adopt in our comprehensive plan this time around and just always be looking at whether it's working in the market and whether it's meeting all of our city goals. I also wanted to talk about development agreements, all planned unit developments in basically every city will accompany um, their approvals will accompany with a development agreement, which is a legally binding contract between the developer and the city. And this is our really our tool for walk in the walk. So this is where it's not just a promise to include the electrical uh, vehicle charging stations. It's, it's actually in the contract. And so um, we can take action if it's not built. 
And development agreements are used for other projects as well. So I just always encourage cities to um, be very mindful of the power that there is in development agreements and the importance of using them. And development agreements are highly negotiated. And the issue for a lot of cities is balancing what the city's priorities with, what the city's priorities are with being development friendly. So Golden Valley has kind of a, I would say a planning legacy of always believing that we don't need developers, developers need us. And that attitude has been not so development friendly over time, but what we've gotten are excellent, excellent projects and we've turned away a lot of so-so projects. Um, we're able to do that because we're an entering suburb with a lot of market demand and high rents. So that's not true for every city, but um, we're trying to balance now being more development friendly, but still getting the best projects. And that really has to happen with all departments that are involved in development. So we actually restructured our city organization so that we have a department that includes engineering, public works, inspections, and planning, all under one director called a physical development director. And they have to coordinate all of us to get along and come together on city priorities and be development friendly while still being pretty picky about the projects that we support. So for future consideration, Golden Valley has not been a city that typically provides a lot of funding to various projects, but we expect that we're going to have to, to get some of the projects that we really want in the city. So tax increment financing is our most common tool. We don't use it a whole lot, but we've noticed that a lot of developers will request it. We don't have a very good set of under, you know, set policy and understanding about what we expect if we're going to be granting TIF to a project. So just like we did with PUDs, we want to be more clear upfront with people. If they're requesting TIF, here's all the things we want. I imagine a lot of Green Step Cities initiatives, including the electric vehicle readiness, will make its way onto that policy. And we'll probably work on that once the comp plan is done this year. We'll start that next year. So this is a word cloud of our comprehensive plan. We've got these are all the words that are showing up in our plan. Infrastructure investment, renewable energy, sustainability, quality redevelopment, green community. We have this new chapter, Great Plains Institute helped us do a vulnerability assessment to get us started. We have six goals. One of them is plan for resilient, sustainable infrastructure. And one of the objectives is to lower citywide transportation related emissions. And then under that, we say improve fuel efficiency of our vehicle fleet, encourage alternative fuel stations and charging stations and the infrastructure. Um, in this first point, it's for commercial sites, office sites and parking ramps. We'll probably add residential in there as well. And then the, the second one is the same, except it's for city campuses and public parking areas. And then lastly, um, we had talked about autonomous vehicles. We said plan, design, and maintain infrastructure to accommodate emerging vehicle technology and most notably connected and automated vehicles. And then that's our policy plan. Then we have an implementation plan, which we never actually had our old comp plan from last time around. Its implementation was kind of, well, just get to work. It didn't really, <laughs> it wasn't very robust. It didn't have any time frame or cost associated with it. Uh, we didn't even have this chapter at all. So now this time around, we have a table of all the different actions that we'll take. Our plan is in five years, 2022, when we're getting you know, to that halfway mark of updating our comp plan again, we'll redo this implementation table and see where we're at and how we've done. But installing alternative fuel charging stations at a city campus is on our five year, five to 10 year plan. And the estimated cost will work out those costs. And then the top one there, research strategies to lower emissions in the city fleet, that's a short term goal. I imagine we'll do a study similar to what Minneapolis did. I think our council members will need to see a cost benefit analysis before moving forward with any decisions about the fleet. Um, same with our staff. So that's all I have for you um, today, and then I think we'll do questions now. So why don't we get all the panelists to come up, and we're really running behind, and so um, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So the four panelists, we five with Eric, come on up, and we'll take a few minutes of questions. We'll go to the resource panel, and I'll keep the part at the co about the cohort at the end pretty short. We might go a few minutes over, but so where are they? Oh, come on up. So questions. France. I mean, Laura. Well, I just wanted to mention since we've seen one great 
Thanks for the comment. All right, questions. They all just rocked it so you've got everything it's clear. Questions from okay, Donna. So how did you get who's paying for the charging station? Is is anybody doing charging stations in the city? Who's paying for it? Is the city paying for it? It's a sense in the city of Minneapolis, the city's paying for it. We are doing some partnering with a couple of businesses where it's a fifty fifty and then we're also in discussion with Excel and getting some charging infrastructure for this. Just a comment on that with businesses. We know um, Lunds and Byerly, any new store that they put in, they are starting to put in charging stations. So if you're looking at a partnership, um, they are a business that would probably be open and willing to talk about that. hy is doing that as well, right? hy is yeah. putting in charging stations only for Tesla. Really? Well, I'm getting shake, not uh, shaking in the back from that. And there's one at Oakdale, right? They're equating a Tesla with an electric vehicle. They're like a Really? Yeah, yeah. Okay. and Rochester plugging my Okay, good to know. So why do you Good in the Goodwill as well. Goodwill. Right. So there's a number of different businesses that are thinking about this, and, and it's important. I actually go to Goodwill more because of that. Um, when I go up north, you know, that is, I spend money there. Um, other questions? A quick comment, City of Adina, that's, uh, I think, Doug Tiffany's tool that you used for the, the calculator, and that's something that Diane and I can make sure that you have. But I was curious about, it seems like the Fleet Carm is a much more robust tool for making these decisions. Is that an expensive uh proposition or how? <laughs> it, it can be, and that's part of the partnership that we have behind that. I, I think as a general guidance, the minimum size they recommend is 20 vehicles on up. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll put one other plug in. I, I always feel like I'm working for fleet cars, but that's not the case. <laughs> uh, one of the things to consider, if there are a number of cities that are interested in having this type of analysis done, Great Plains Institute is trying to get a group purchase around that service. Uh, that will help drive the cost down. As a rule of thumb, if you're talking about 20 vehicles, think around $600 per vehicle, but you own the telematic device, so as you do additional uh, studies, the, the cost drops. But with uh, a combined effort, if you had 100 or 200, that cost drops you know, a couple hundred dollars per vehicle. So something to seriously consider if you have a number of people that are interested in that. One more question, and then I think we're gonna try to move on. Uh, yeah, Eric. Um, yes. Do you, does that uh, kind of partnership that you have, would that work? No, uh, I don't think that will work with Excel, is that true? Uh, Excel is on their own. They are, well, no, I will say they're lagging behind where we are, but that's kind of the nice thing. Like, uh, are they able to partner with cities for this kind of fleet? If you don't. I, I have no idea what their plans are. Yeah, he works for a different electric deal. I would talk to Excel. I mean, yeah. you know, perhaps some of the cities that have done um, partners in energy, maybe that's a conversation I have with them. But it's a, if, they are, if they want a rate base, they'll cover it. They have to go through the PUC. It right. doesn't preclude them, however, from doing individual partnerships. Okay. And the Partners in Energy program is actually one good example. They don't they don't recover that directly through the rates. It's not a step program. So. Okay. Thank the panel, please, so much. For being here. So, oh, did you lock it on? Oh, there we go. Uh, all right. There we go. So, Larry Herkey is from the um, uh, Office of Enterprise Sustainability with the Department of Administration of the State of Minnesota and has great tools to offer um, cities um, that are thinking about looking at electric vehicles. Hello, and good morning from the State of Minnesota. My office just up the block here, block and a half, block to work this morning. Um, <laughs> But uh, our office is fairly new. We started in August of 2016, and I'll tell you a little bit. We put a lot of focus in on fleet to begin with, so you can see some of the results of what we've been working on. Um, the picture in the upper right-hand corner was my longest trip in uh, Ford Bolt. That was 131 miles, 262 miles in one day, oh. an electric vehicle <laughs> at 13 degrees. So it can be done. Um, that was a trip where we went up to see sustainability in action up at Camper Place, where we were that day. 
A um, couple items um, you may or may not know that there's a new executive order on sustainability out that can help not only in the area of fleet, but maybe some other areas. Um, this particular uh, um, executive order was signed in November of last year and went into effect as of December. It sets goals in the areas of fleet, greenhouse gas, um, water, energy, procurement, um, all those areas are covered uh, in this particular executive order. It is focused on the 24 cabinet level agencies, but uh, we encourage others to follow along, uh, specifically other small boards and so forth in, uh, in state government. It has a governance structure, which actually says for once, this is how you'll report your information and where your information will go. It'll provide great transparency. It establishes my office four-person office, one of the four people being a Green Corps member from uh, MPCA. And um, so a small office to watch and monitor what's going on. But I thought I'd just put that out there, and I think I, hand, I gave that to Diana as part of your stuff. But the one I wanted to pull off here is the fleet <clears throat> goal, which is a 30% reduction in consumption of fossil fuels, and a lot of discussion over the wording, but we felt the focus on fossil fuels was the best way to go about that. That hits both the greenhouse gas side and works our way towards alternative forms of transportation. We're doing that based on uh, 2017, so we've made some progress in the past, but we're really looking going forward and what impacts can we have in this area. We've got a commitment. As my first thing, I think I was here just a couple months, and they said uh, we need to do a letter to the White House and tell them that uh, Minnesota is on board and we need some help finding different types of um, electric vehicles and alternate fuel vehicles for the state. Uh, so we made a commitment there of 20% in the light fleet, which is below 8,000 gross vehicle weight uh, vehicles for us, which is the majority of our vehicles, not probably the majority of our emissions, but that's the majority of the vehicles in the state fleet, which we believe, I should know pretty soon, but I believe it's about 10,000 vehicles that we include both the on-road and off-road vehicles. Uh, we had, uh, I got a chance to negotiate with GM and we got Chevy Volts here at the same time that New York State and California got theirs. So I thought felt pretty good about that. Actually talked to them on the first day of production in the plant and uh, <clears throat> we'd asked for 25. Uh, 13 went to state agencies and nine to local governments. And we saw an example of that here with the city of Minneapolis. Uh, we also, um, Talked a lot about installing infrastructure. 52 level level two charging stations. We were able to find money that was um, available on a one-time basis to uh, do some um, more installs. So we're up to 69. I think as of last year, anyway, that was the greatest amount of charging stations on one campus uh, anywhere in Minnesota. So our first steps were the early distribution of Chevy Bolts in June. We established. Um, we actually helped establish, get GM to establish some dealerships that because you actually have to have the tools and the maintenance people that are qualified to actually sell the vehicle. So I think that will help out everyone in the future here. Uh, we have a state contract that was negotiated. It was the same price as the state of New York got. I think the price actually went down a little bit this year, and that's what's in the handout that was uh, provided. And um, so I think that that's a plus to get us started and the prices were good. We did our evaluation. I didn't know about the tool at that time, but uh, we did our own evaluation and we, we figured we save about 1,000 to 1,500 on the life cycle of each vehicle. And I would say that probably is a little higher now with the new price that just recently came out. I did want to point out that the Chevy Volt was a motor trend year, North American car of the year and the green car of the year. So it had three very distinct um, designations for its first year out. Uh, a little bit more about it, the, the price, and with, when I say state options, that does include like the level one charging, which is extra, and some of the heated mirrors and windows and so forth. Uh, I think our negotiated price is actually less than that for the base vehicle, if you wanted to buy one straight and outright, just the plain one. But the way we buy them is about 36,000, and that's what's modeled in the handout that was provided. It does have a range of 238, uh, we've found that based on the temperature, it can be about 10 to 20% reduction in your, uh, your range based on uh, 
how cold it is out, but still there was enough to get to that Camp Ripley location and back using Goodwill. Uh, both times, so you get coffee, and then we went shopping Goodwill the second time. <laughs> uh, it does. It is a contact. I can tell you that it does feel like a midsize. We had four grown adults men in the vehicle when we went up there, and everything worked out all right. Um, has a great warranty. The drivetrain is covered for five years, and electronic components for up to 100,000 miles. Um, first thing I get asked by all state agencies, why don't we have an all-wheel drive vehicle? Because it seems like about half of our vehicles in state government are all all-wheel drive. So this year we actually have an uh, all-wheel drive alternative, the Mitsubishi Outlander. That's also modeled in here. Um, we're trying to work with Mitsubishi to see if we can get the federal tax credit taken by somebody along the line. We did that with the Bolt too. We were unsuccessful. Uh, the state of New York was successful. So we think there's a possibility here, so I did put what the amount is, just in case that does come through. Right now, they're still negotiating that. The first 22 miles are all electric, and the dealer said it could be up to 35, but what it says in all the write-ups is the first 22 miles are electric, and it has a combined MPGE of 74. It does have a regular two-liter engine in it, so those people that are concerned about that part of it, it uh, has a regular engine in there. It does have a very fast charge. We were doing demonstration rides, and he was getting um, between 80 and 85 percent within 30 minutes for the times that he was giving his talk in between travel. So that's very, very good. It has the same warranty, and it's been Europe's best-selling plug-in since 2013. So it's uh, tops in Europe right now. I did get a chance to go in it again. It's uh, I think uh, probably a little more space than a RAV, Toyota RAV4, which is the vehicle we were selling the most, or getting out to most agencies prior to this. What's the next step? We're, uh, I put up my hand because I do have an outline for a fleet action plan. Uh, so I actually have to have a plan to get to that 30% reduction. Uh, once I get that done, I'll, I will share it with the, I think it's approved, I'll share it here with the world. Um, I think about some very interesting. We looked at the city of Seattle and some of the other states that have plans and putting ours together based on that. Uh, we're going to have the sustainability reporting tool, which we talked about a little bit this morning. That will also be something that will be available to cities. I suspect in about another year or year and a half, we're just developing that tool right now. That's the visibility and the transparency part of it. So that's how we're going to track how we're doing with this. Right now, we're using spreadsheets to help. The agencies to see themselves in 10 years and the plan of the futures use the tool. Uh, we are looking at reduce the reduced uh, evening rates for fleet charging, uh, working with utilities for that, and also we're looking for rebates. And if we get those, those would be available, I believe, for uh, local governments also. We're able to get those negotiated. And got my contact information. And I think on to the next presenter. Yeah, so sorry, we're scrambling now. I didn't use my book well enough earlier, so Fran, why don't you come up? Fran is with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency and probably the person in the state of Minnesota that has worked longest and hardest on electric vehicle adoption. So you can just forward to your slide. There you go. Thanks, Fran. Okay. Thank you, Diane. Uh, cities are ideal for showcasing and advancing electric vehicle use. Uh, we've got when you've got electric vehicles out in the communities, they become really visible. People say, "Wow, I, look at that vehicle! It's actually viable. Maybe I should think about using it." <coughs> you've got them out, you know, using using the vehicles for inspections, and now we hear um, Minneapolis for parking enforcement or transporting tools for public works and this kind of thing. And so it, it really is a good way to get folks in your community thinking about electric vehicles. Um, Larry mentioned this already, so I'll just go through this briefly. Probably one of the biggest ways that the state can help cities and counties is through our uh, statewide contract purchasing. This relieves you of the burden of having to go through a bid process, you know, three, four months of work. You can simply go to the list of dealers that have the vehicles available and go ahead and purchase the vehicle once you make a decision on it. So the pricing and the, and the contract itself has already been worked out and with this you know, pricing spreadsheet and the contract itself. So um, really useful. 
this year we have uh, the most electric vehicles that we've ever had on state contract. It's not easy getting them on contract because it involves a lot of paperwork from the dealers. So I have to really give um, credit to the Department of Admin for all the hard work they've done to get these six vehicles on state contract. We have two full electric vehicles, the Nissan Leaf and the Chevy Bolt. Uh, these, of course, have zero emissions from the tailpipe. They have no tailpipe. And then you've got your plug-in electric vehicles, which have the gas backup. Uh, the advantage here is that you, you don't, you're not limited on your battery range. As long as you can get to a gas station, you have unlimited range. However, you've got maintenance of a, an electric engine that you've got to consider. So uh, pluses and minuses. The Outlander, which Larry talked about, yes, and then you know, that's just available this year. Very exciting. All-wheel drive. It's also got a towing capability of, I believe, 1,500 pounds. So, um, and, and as Larry mentioned, it's been real popular in Europe when we finally got it here in the U.S. So that opens up a lot of options for fleets. And then the, the Chevy Volt, which I think most people are pretty familiar with. Uh, Chrysler Pacifica, also a new option as of late last year. We've got a van, a plug-in electric van. This is brand new. It was in California, but it, it, we now have it available in Minnesota. And then the Ford Fusion. So uh, to make the case for electric vehicles with your fleets and your city councils is uh, one, of the, one of the things you can look at is the maintenance, much less maintenance on electric vehicles. You've got hundreds of fewer parts. So, for example, here you take a look at the Chevy Bolt, Bolt and essentially you've got the cabin filter, and you know, that filter is, uh, filters the air that comes into your car. You need to change that out once in a while. You need to rotate your tires once in a while, but that's pretty much it versus the Chevy Cruze. If you look at that um, maintenance, you've got all that maintenance of a, of a you know, gas engine, oil changes, transmission fluid, all of that. Uh, one of the other things that you might want to use to make the case, in addition to greenhouse gases, is taking a look at public health impacts, especially in cities when you've got high population centers and high road traffic. You've got um, things like uh, all that tailpipe emission does directly impact public health. And here you've got a cancer risk assessment uh, that was done by our MinRisk work here at, at the MPCA. Uh, another resource related to this is the Minnesota Department of Health has just recently put out similar type data on roadway impacts of public health. And you can find this on their website. And it's, the links are in our best practice 23, right, Philip? Yeah, the front page of the best practice. For Green Cap City. So you can get to the links and they can explore this. There's a lot of different data options here. So uh, another perspective to take on why uh, we should be going with electric vehicles. Uh, and then I think someone else showed this is a vehicle, a uh, fleet vehicle that you can get off the federal Clean Cities Department of Energy website. I'll, I'll briefly touch on this. I'm limited on what I can talk about in terms of the Volkswagen environmental settlement. Uh, as you've probably heard, this is related to the nitrous oxide emissions that were illegally emitted from Volkswagen vehicles sold here in the U.S. As a result, there was a settlement and mitigation funds distributed to the state state so that they can make up or compensate for those emissions. Here, um, up to 15% of that settlement can be used for electric vehicle charging stations. That includes the fast charges, level twos, this is optional, um, it's not a requirement. And I can also say that our draft uh, beneficiary and mitigation plan is being drafted. One thing I can say is that of the public comments of the stakeholder and technical ones that we received, the most common comment was the support for electric vehicle charging station infrastructure development. So the, the BMP is expected to be out for review the first part of this year sometime, so you'll have a, a chance to comment on that. That's the most I can say at this point. All right. 
Mike, I don't want you to feel rushed, but be I'm quick. Feel Mike. <laughs> <laughs> so this is Mike from the National Joint Powers Alliance um, in Staples, Minnesota, that has extended um, uh, options for um, cities to look at for um, purchasing. So I'm Mike Doman. I'm from NJPA, National Joint Powers Alliance. How many of you here have heard about this? Okay. Quite a few. So um, the reason why I'm here is I have our vehicle contract, two of our vehicle contracts, and some of our uh, infrastructure uh, contract. So uh, I was introduced to Great Plains Institute through Fleets for the Future. We've been working with Fleets for the Future for the last year, year and a half, um, from going to, to shows on a national level and uh, becoming more involved with them through the city of LA, through the state of New York and whatnot. So uh, they reached out to us to help really promote alternative fuels on a national level. So that's kind of the, the behind the scenes of of how um, I get introduced to this group. So who is NJPA? We are a government agency. We're based in the state of Minnesota. We're one of the nine service co-ops out there in Minnesota, the smallest one. Um, we're all public employees. And really what we're, our goal is, is just to deliver solutions to our members. And our members are any education and governmental units and nonprofits out there. They can become members of NJPA at no cost, no obligation, no liability. For that. So that's really our goals. Um, so why? the need for EV and EVSE contracts. Well, our members reached out to us and this is what they wanted. And we like to listen to our members. Um, so we know that uh, there's a growing demand for green initiatives. We all know that, that's why we're here. We also wanted to pay our EV contracts with our infrastructure. So some of our members really reached out for the infrastructure piece. They have some solutions already in place, such as the Department of Administration for Minnesota. But for the infrastructure, they're finding a hard time going out on their own for that. Um, and then we really want to provide our members with that turnkey solution to satisfy, to satisfy their unique needs. That full catalog. You have the EV vehicle along with the infrastructure. So one of the contracts we have, I just want to point out, is Zenus Motors. Um, they, they offer a full 100% electric cargo vans, shuttle vans, and step vans. That's one of our electric vehicle contracts that And then National Auto Fleet Group is our contract. We like to do it, NJP is awarded at the OEM level, but unfortunately they're for GM and them, they don't, they're not quite ready for that <laughs> state level, but they're not quite ready for that total cooperative purchasing out there yet. So these are just some of the examples that are out there um, through National Auto Fleet Group. What you can do is you can build your vehicle online they have some options where you know a lot of the EV vehicles don't have a ton of options like that. You can also go into some, I didn't put them up here, but you know, like your Ford F-150, if you wanted to use an XL hybrid on that too, that's another option out there. So that's our National Auto Fleet Group contract. Now I'll go into our EVSE contracts. We had 14 responses. We also go through a competitive process, much like you would. Can you say what EVSE is? Electric Vehicle Supply Equipment, sorry. So we did. We awarded five vendors. You'll see those at the bottom. Some offer, you know, net, Green Lots was like a, is like a network, but they also added some of the stations on there too. Charge Point, of course, is Charge Point. There, I do have a handout up back there that has all these logos on them, along with the EV logos. Also. So we did this. The reason why we went out for this, one of the big reasons, the state of New York reached out to us. Hey, okay, we're we're having an issue. We can't go get this. Can we help you? So we said, absolutely. So we went out. They're awarded probably springtime, May, June-ish. Uh, so like I was telling Larry, this we're just starting to roll this out. The interest is just starting to come in on these uh, uh, EVSE contracts. So really that's it. And one of those, I just want to put it on top there. Those solutions are really turnkey. So there's that site assessment for that infrastructure, site prep, installation, and then your hardware and the network providers. It's really a turnkey solution with that. Because one of the things we're saying is, how do you put installation in that cooperative agreement? Because what, the cost of labor in Red Wing is probably different than Minneapolis versus Virginia, Minnesota. So they've incorporated some of that into the contract to address some of that stuff. So if you have any questions, you can reach out to Scott Carr. He's on the EDSC, the charging station side. And you can reach out to myself, up to me for any EV related. I just want to point out, like Minneapolis said, we have other contracts that are also going to so called green. Our refuse haulers are looking more and more on the CNG. 
we're going out with Seeds for the Future in the spring to do a kind of a promotion volume for volume purchasing with some of the rest of the So I just wanted to point that out. Thank you. Thank you. That. Thanks, Mike, so much. It's over, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the cohort peer learning opportunity, and then if there's questions for the resource panel, we'll take those, if that makes sense, because I want people to not miss this. So um, for the last couple of years, both CERTS and Great Plains Institute, um, um, mostly via Drive Electric Minnesota, but also just Great Plains in general, have been talking about ways to support local governments in the kind of the path um, towards electric vehicles. And, um, you know, it seems like we're at a moment in time right now where there's a lot of interest. And so one of the ways we like to do um, collaborations that help people learn and get um, more excited about things is to bring together peers and learn in a cohort um, together uh, about opportunities. So we are offering um, that um, to um, who, of whichever local governments in the state are interested. So in the follow-up email, we will have um, some information and um, an email. You can email me if you're interested and based on the interest. You know, we will probably do some statewide webinars and things, but then also perhaps some smaller um, groups um, that meet in person around the state, again, depending on the geography. And, um, and so um, what we want, what we'll offer is technical assistance from CERTS, Great Plains Institute, the state of Minnesota, and others. Um, technical assistance will be focused on actions and best practices that local governments can Im uh, implement to accelerate the adoption of EVs, such as including electric vehicles in city, city purchasing plans, installing electric charging infrastructure in public parking areas, providing guidance on EV-ready development in the private sector. We will also be asking for feedback on tools that we're developing to help put together more information. So this is like a pilot for other cities, guides, where do you start, what do you do, how do you, how do you get going. Um, preference will be given to Green Step Cities particip um, participants. Uh, it'll start in January of this, you know, this month, uh, proceeding as long as it's useful. Um, so, um, we, you know, again, we want folks to let us know our benefits of the participation. You'll hear from experts, connect to resources for fleet procurement, learn from your peers, connect to your electric utility. We can help you with that and potential opportunities for bulk purchase discounts. We've heard about a number of different things, um, in the room today. Um, and some of the resources we're going to be developing and testing as part of this process is the EV readiness guide to be incorporated into Green Step Cities, electric fish vehicle decision tree um, and some FAQs, but you know, how do you decide level two fast charger? Like, I think a lot of people, you know, how do I make that decision? So we're gonna be putting together some decision trees to help cities kind of go through that process and an EV calculator to also support that decision making. So that's some of it. And you might have ideas about other things that we can come up with, et cetera, that will be useful. It's a pilot. And so um, I'm just curious if there's any interest just, you know, in the room at this point. Wow. <laughs> okay. Um, clearly by the full room in the webinar, um, there's interest. So um, there will be information in the follow-up email. You can email me and we'll just kind of see who we've got and see how to move forward with that. With that, um, I'd like to turn it over to see if there's any questions for the resource panel. We had Larry and Fran and Mike, all with some great resources for electric vehicles. Um, questions for them. And I'll just let you guys sit where you are. Yeah, Alexis. So the question was, so do local governments have um, access to the price point through the state contract, Larry? So if you're a cooperative first state venture member, which is basically many cities already are, if you're not, you could become one, then you have access to those that pricing. And you can either buy them outright for uh, the contract that Rand had up, or you can lease them actually through the fleet services through the state of Minnesota. And those are some of the prices you saw on the sheet that I provided. So the question is for the National Joint Powers Alliance, how do you get access to that, um, th those price points? Yeah, it's the same thing. Membership, you go to our website, just click the Join Now tab, sign up for it, you get, the, you get your membership ID. Then you, what we do is we work with our vehicle contracts a little different. We work with National Auto Fleet Group who holds that contract. Everyone has a landing page, you reach out to them, they can get you the prices. You can go in there, register for their site, you can build your vehicles right online too. To get some of the and there's no price for the membership, right? No, no price. And I, I don't just, cost. I just Frank. wanted to mention also that the state has our 
has a charging station contract as well. So, so there's lots of options. Yep. Yeah. I noticed that you had the Ford Fusion Hybrid on there as one of the state uh, vehicles. <coughs> I've seen a configuration of that for these vehicles. Is that available? They actually tested that this summer in Michigan and we're still waiting for the results to come back, whether that's going to be available. Right now, in our light fleet, 15 16% is law enforcement, and we see that as a big plus if that actually gets approved. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, for those experts, um, are there any upcoming conferences or other things that we could send our vehicle um, operations managers to. Mm -hmm. Most of the people in this room are more right. ability coordinators, our right. partners are the decision right. makers. I don't know if there's any conferences coming up, but one thing I'll just say, because what you just brought up made me think of something as maybe part of this cohort, maybe what we see is a need for a webinar or something specifically for fleet managers or public works directors um, that you could hopefully get them to attend. So maybe that would be one of the results coming out of this um, is if they're the decision makers or they're the ones that are the indirect decision makers, you know, a, a city manager or a mayor is not going to do it unless they say yes. Maybe that is something that we need to do is provide some more information for them specifically. Wait, uh, someone had a uh, green fleet in Indianapolis is probably the best one for looking at green equipment that's used in public sector. Green fleets in Indianapolis, it's a conference? Yes. And do you know when that is? Uh, sometime in April, I believe. Okay, will you March, make a note of that so March, that we can put that March in? March 6th to the 9th. All right, then. So we'll put that in the email, too. This is going to be a really long follow-up email. <laughs> <laughs> and a shameless plug would be March 28th and 29th in yeah. St. Cloud, the yeah. first conference. And on the second day, there is a ride and drive, and I will have multiple speakers from Indianapolis. Yeah. 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 Yeah.